Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday rundown where I fill you in on all the latest Starship updates, launch events from the past week, and everything else that I think is interesting. And boy, this is a longer episode than normal because there is just so much to discuss. We had a real cascade of Starship updates and information last week, some huge news from Rocket Lab about their upcoming Neutron rocket, and a whole bunch of launches of a variety of rockets, including the world's most metal launch vehicle. Let's not delay any further and roll that intro and kick off, as we always do, with Starship updates. Let's get the big one right out of the way. On Monday, we saw a Starship vehicle roar like never before. Check this out. Yep, that's Booster 7 performing a static fire of seven of its Raptor engines. More Raptor engines simultaneously fired than we have ever seen before. This was a test predicted by many after the seven engine spin prime test on Friday the 16th of September. Unfortunately, we did get a little bit of a grass fire in the aftermath, though thankfully it didn't look anywhere near as dramatic as with the Ship 24 six engine static fire. We were treated to an official SpaceX drone video of the event as well, which is always a very welcome thing with these tests. I just wish they'd upload somewhere other than Twitter so we're not locked to a grainy 720p video, I guess. Happily, we were also treated to a cosmic perspective upload. They filmed the static fire in ultra high speed, 9,000 frames per second, to capture an amazing slow motion shot. I'll give you a tease with a real time take, follow that card on screen and or link in the description to see the full resolution slow mo with amazing audio. Anyway, Elon later confirmed that Booster 7 would return to the high bay for robustness upgrades and to allow Booster 8 to move to the launch pad to begin its testing campaign. Though this will likely just be limited to cryo-proofing tests, nothing dramatic, as Elon went on to state that the next big test will probably be a full stack wet dress rehearsal, much like what we've seen with the Artemis 1 mission so far, which will be followed by a static fire of all 33 engines firing, which will be a momentous occasion. This will be the first time a Super Heavy fires all of its engines, and will also be the first time that we've seen a static fire fire with a fully stacked Starship and Super Heavy vehicle. Following the seven engine static fire test, we saw two Raptor engines removed from the base of the vehicle. At this stage, it's too early to determine if these are destined for the scrap heap or if SpaceX wants to make repairs or just do an in-depth inspection. We'll have to wait and see. But yes, Booster 8. Here it is being rolled out for the first time for all to see, as captured by the ever-dependable Starship Gazer. It's still needing its grid fins and, uh, engines, but other than that, it's looking pretty complete. Meanwhile, Booster 7 was lifted off the launch table using the Mechazilla cat charms, and it was lowered down to make way for Booster 8. Lav Padre captured the entire thing on video, and we got this cool picture from Nick Ansuini. We then got a SpaceX drone shot time-lapse of the rollback of Booster 7. Again, another welcome piece of content from SpaceX's official cameras. Hopefully this is a sign that we'll get more from them to come. <laughs> Starship Gazer captured this image of the empty launch table, and as you can see, the seven engine static fire has left it a little bit charred. <laughs> Last week, we saw a Starlink Pez dispenser being loaded into the payload bay of Ship 27, although it has since been reassigned to Ship 26. This is the mechanism that SpaceX will use to fire out the Starlink V2 satellites, much like a Pez dispenser, hence the nickname that Elon has affectionately given this system. Animator Chameleon Circuit created this great little render, showing one way in which the dispensers may work. Check out their Twitter through the link in the description and go show them some support. Last week, I briefly mentioned how Starship Gazer had caught some shots of workers reinforcing the payload bay door of Ship 24. At least at the time, we believed this to be reinforcement work. But this past week, workers were spotted fitting a metal plate over the entirety of the door, apparently sealing it off. A couple of days later, and the door was completely sealed shut, with the cover thoroughly tack welded around the edges. This looks like SpaceX permanently sealing shut the payload bay door of Ship 24, deciding that the very first orbital flight test of the Starship vehicle would be too risky to fly live Starlink V2 satellites. I wonder if Ship 24 will still carry the wheel of cheese to orbit like the plan was with Ship 20. I love this photo taken by Starbase Surfer on the 20th of September, showing workers handling Raptor 49. Now I have no comments regarding this in relation to you know, Starship news and all that, I just wanted to show you the picture. I just, I just think it's neat. <laughs> Go follow Starbase Surfer for more. 
I mentioned Elon making some tweets about Starship development earlier. Well, the man has been on something of a Starship Twitter spree in this past week, sharing quite a lot of juicy information. For starters, he stated that SpaceX's focus right now is on improving the reliability of Booster 7 and completing Booster 9, which apparently has had many design upgrades, especially for avoiding rapid unplanned disassembly. Gee, I, I wonder what event inspired this goal. <laughs> it's interesting he didn't say much of Booster 8. Now, whether or not this is still planned to fly is still unclear. It may well go the way of Starship SN12, 13, and 14, which were all scrapped after SpaceX developed lots of upgrades with SN15, rendering them obsolete. Will Booster 8 go the way of the scrapped Starships? Watch this space. X. Haha. -ha. Sorry, I've just not done that pun in a while, and I really enjoy making you all suffer. <laughs> now, Elon also stated in a reply to a Twitter user regarding when the first orbital flight would be that SpaceX would be aiming for October, but that it is likely that this will slip to November. Though I'm remaining hopeful, but I also recall him saying some similar statements about launching in January 2022 and even earlier dates as well. Though I think this time, this time, it's hopefully slightly more believable given the unprecedented level of testing we've been seeing from Booster 7 and Ship 24. As for whether or not Booster 7 will succeed on the first flight, Elon did say that there was some hesitancy about its reliability. After all, its engine isolation systems were done as a retrofit, as opposed to Booster 9, which was built with engine isolation from the ground up. This could perhaps be another nail in the coffin for Booster 8, which presumably is effectively just a clone of Booster 7. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Will Booster 8 go the same way as Booster 5, or will it still fly? And hey, while you're down there writing that comment, if you are enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to leave a like to help support what I do here, and consider subscribing if you want to get these videos in your feed every Monday to help you stay in the loop about all things Starship and Space News. Check out this time lapse from Lab Padre. This is the first full test of the new fire suppression system on the orbital launch mount. The gas being expelled here is high pressure nitrogen gas, which will help displace oxygen and atomize water molecules. And a little bit before this was filmed, we saw SpaceX testing the water deluge aspect of the fire suppression system. Note that this is not a conventional water deluge system. We believe it's only here to assist in fire suppression. Our team in the skies, Greg, Scott, and Fariel performed another flyover of Starbase Cape Canaveral last week. We can see the mechanism that will lift the chopsticks up and down the launch tower, and the Starbase factory building continues to spring up at an impressive pace. There will be no tent at Starbase Roberts Road, just a big factory building, and of course, Starbase Boca Chica will eventually be the same, with the construction of the Starbase factory at Boca Chica and at Cape Canaveral happening simultaneously. We also saw several shots of pieces of the next launch tower, Starship Launch Tower number 3. We also got some great aerial shots of the fully stacked Pad 39A launch tower as well. Speculation is really starting to increase about the purpose and ultimate location of the third SpaceX Starship launch tower. I've mentioned this in the last couple of episodes or so, but in short, SpaceX are building a second launch tower in Florida. The three main schools of thought here are 1. This will be for crewed flights rather than cargo only, which presumably is what the Boca Chica and Pad 39A towers will be used for. 2. Due to its proximity to the very important Falcon 9 pad at 39A, which is NASA's only launch pad for crewed launches at the moment, SpaceX cannot use pad 39A to either catch the Super Heavy booster or the Starship upper stage. Therefore, the new tower will be for catching and the 39A tower for stacking. Or three, more is more. More towers enable a higher launch cadence, which is SpaceX's objective with Starship. Which school of thought do you subscribe to? Or do you have any other ideas for what incentive to build a third launch tower could be? I'd love to hear your theories down below. Hey, Madpat, do you have any theories? Any Starship theories? Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that in this photo here, it seems that SpaceX are preparing to install pistons and gas springs to the Mechazilla arms for Pad 39A. So it is likely that they're at least setting up the capability to catch ships at 39A. There's a chance that NASA won't allow this until at least Starliner is flight ready, so that the US still has crewed launch capabilities in the event of damage to the Falcon 9 pad at 39A. Anyway, with regard to when we'll see the first Super Heavy booster at launch pad 39A, we've been wondering if SpaceX will be building all the Floridian launch vehicles at their Roberts Road facility, or if they'll be shipping them up from Starbase, Texas. And it looks like we now have our answer. Elon has stated that we can expect to see the first Super Heavy booster hopefully as soon as the second quarter of 2023, with the vehicles initially being shipped up by boat from the port of Brownsville, which is obviously where, you know, Boca Chica is. 
In the early hours of Monday, SpaceX successfully launched another 54 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit, with another Falcon 9 that took flight from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage cleanly landed on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. This particular Falcon 9 first stage was B-1067, which has previously supported five missions, CRS-22, Crew-3, Turksat-5B, Crew-4, and CRS-25. Now I get to talk about one of my favorite rockets, the Delta IV Heavy. By size, it's the biggest operational rocket on the planet, and in order to hype up its Enrol 91 launch on Saturday, United Launch Alliance posted some great montage shots of its metal startup sequence, in which the rocket sets itself on fire. <laughs> the reason it sets itself on fire like this is because the liquid hydrogen valves to the three engines open at around two seconds before the oxygen valves do, so during those two seconds, the hydrogen is leaving the engines without being ignited, and it drifts away from the rocket, but upon full ignition it gets sucked back in and ignites, causing this big fireball effect up the sides of the rocket. The rocket is insulated against this and it is a normal part of its operation, but I do agree with United Launch Alliance that this is a rather metal move. It's hard to make that sound cool though with my uh, British accent, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the launch went very well and the rocket successfully deployed its classified payload to its intended orbit. And what a sight the launch was. We've got to start making the most of these though, as this latest mission puts the Delta IV Heavy very close to retirement. This launch was the last time the vehicle will ever launch from Vandenberg, and in total there are just two flights remaining for this beast, one in the first quarter of 2023 and the other in the first quarter of 2024. Here's hoping they go just as well as last week's mission. On the 21st of September, we saw the launch of Soyuz MS-22, which you can see on screen in this unedited, non-political footage. The vehicle launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, and the rocket carried Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Petalin, as well as, interestingly, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. Given the current tensions between Russia and almost everyone, it's curious to see American astronauts still flying on Soyuz. This mission was, of course, planned well in advance, before Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine, which is why this mission even happened. But it is still interesting that it did happen, given the international tensions between the West and Russia. The spacecraft successfully autonomously docked to the RASVET module of the International Space Station, and the crew are planned to stay aboard the International Space Station for just over six months. On the 20th of September, we saw China launch a trusty Long March 2D from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center. The rocket carried a single satellite, the Yunhai 103, which according to official sources will mainly be used for detecting the atmospheric, marine and space environments, disaster prevention and scientific experiments. Not a lot else is really known about the satellite. It was launched to replace the Yunhai 102, which was apparently destroyed after colliding with a piece of space junk originating from a Russian Zenit 2 rocket. Later on in the week, we saw another launch from China. This was a Kwaizu 1A, which took off on Saturday from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center, carrying the Cheyenne 14 and Cheyenne 15 satellites to orbit. Official sources have reported that both satellites are now operational, and that Cheyenne 14 will be mainly used to conduct scientific experiments and verify new technologies, while Cheyenne 15 will provide data in the fields of land survey, urban planning, and disaster prevention. Now, we had some big announcements from Rocket Lab on Thursday. CEO Peter Beck made his Investor Day update, and in this talk, he shared some juicy information about the company's Neutron rocket. He shared this photo of half of a first stage section of fuel tank, with a crew member in the middle to give us a sense of scale for this thing. Compared to Electron, Neutron is huge. In fact, the background behind Peter isn't part of the stage backdrop. That's it! That's half a piece of fuel tank for Neutron. Peter also highlighted that Rocket Lab already having fuel tank segments is very significant because these are carbon composite tanks, meaning that they've already perfected the molds and tooling required to build, at least in part, the Neutron rocket. He also clarified that having carbon fuel tank segments already built is a marker of further progress than if they were using, say, as a totally random example, metallic components, because metals can be worked on and iterated on very quickly and easily. Carbon is a much harder beast to work with. 
He went on to state that the first fuel tanks will be completed by the end of the year. We also had some clarifications about the capabilities of Neutron. The rocket will be able to carry 15 tons to orbit in expendable configuration, which is a smidge under the 16.7 tons Falcon 9 can carry when landing on an automated drone ship. Neutron's payload to orbit capacity with recovery of the first stage will be 13 tons in total if landing downrange, presumably on an ocean platform much like the SpaceX ones, and it'll be 8 tons if the rocket is going to be returning back to land. One of the new Neutron design changes of note are the payload doors, or fairing covers. There are only two segments now, not four, to increase the simplicity and reliability of the rocket. Rocket Lab also didn't announce a crew capsule for Neutron, but they did create this render of one and stated that they were looking into it. So crewed Neutron could well be something we see in the future. Speaking of new renders, they shared this impression of what the Neutron launch site will look like at the Wallops facility in Virginia. We saw some updates regarding the Archimedes engine too. The biggest update here is that the engine has been changed from gas generator to oxygen-rich staged combustion. Full specs of this engine are on screen. Peter Beck said that while these numbers might not seem as impressive as other rocket engines, the goal with Archimedes is reliability and reusability. He likened it to an aeroplane engine. You don't want to be on an aeroplane with the engines operating within 1% limit of their capabilities. You want them operating well within safety thresholds so that they're less likely to fail in flight, which is a similar principle with the operating levels of the Archimedes engine. Last week closed off with another successful Falcon 9 Starlink launch. This was Starlink Vision 435, in which the Falcon 9 deployed 52 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. Shortly after stage separation, the Falcon 9 made a successful landing on the drone ship A Shortfall of Gravitas in the Atlantic Ocean. This first stage was Booster B-1073, which had previously supported three missions, SES-22 and two Starlink missions. Now over at Laon Aerospace, a big mission was pulled off on Saturday. This was Operation Minima Space Hotel and Casino, which saw a multi-vehicle mission beginning with a supersonic airliner, a terrestrial transfer vehicle, a high-capacity crew and cargo SSTO, and the titular Minma Space itself. You can check this mission out by following the applicable card on screen. And hey, if you want to join that list of names on the left, then consider supporting my channel on Patreon to help me keep making these videos for you all. Guys, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.